Society, and it is a real delight to see so many of you here this evening. Um, we have delayed already, so I'm not going to mess around. The motion before the House tonight is, this House believes that Cambridge is institutionally sexist. Uh, our speakers this evening, in proposition, we have the Cambridge University Students Union Women's Officer, Natalie Zarek. structures 
as co everything from colleges to faculties to course structures to funding systems. I hope everyone's okay. There seems to be quite a lot of illness in this room. Um, feel better, really. Um, it doesn't pain me at all to say that there has been remarkable progress on this front. Women now graduate with the same degrees. That's only been happening for 60 years, 28 years less than Oxford. Shame on you, Cambridge, but we're at a good place right now, so that is something to be celebrated. But there are still some barriers structurally preventing women from achieving as much as they could be. Um, for example, the failure of the university to offer part-time degrees means that student parents are the most affected. And even though a single father will struggle to get funding, flexibility, accommodation, childcare, because more women are primary carers, this actually affects women a lot more. And if you look at leadership, the lack of high-ranking women in, in the university means that we are largely a university led by men and geared towards men. And this <coughs> isn't about maliciousness, this isn't about misogyny. It's about a failure to be able to take gender into account. So we do have an amazing woman at the helm of our organization, Alison Richards, the vice chancellor. But having a woman at the top of an organization doesn't necessarily mean that this organization is gender equal. I mean, forgive me, uh, for, I hope the vice chancellor forgives me for this, but look at Sarah Palin. Like, she's not very woman friendly. And luckily, Alison Richards is nothing like Sarah Palin, but it doesn't, it doesn't work just like that. We don't need just token representation. We actually need a massive overhaul, an evaluation of how we see gender played out in our society. And we need an, uh, an awareness of that. Just like a lot of white people ruling a university, being in charge of something, are not able to adequately represent everybody. They need to take other views into account. And they can't do that by putting one black person on the <coughs> committee. It actually needs to be a commitment to change, not a commitment to sort of token changes and superficial adjustments. So this brings me to the second element, it's informal structures and norms. The culture of university determines how its institution is sexist. So these informal practices, trends and norms means that the university isn't just formal regulations. Um, so the inequalities present in our society, I mentioned the pay gap, but there are countless more that I'm sure we're all aware of. These manifest in Cambridge as well. And it doesn't mean that, oh, well, Cambridge is in a sexist society, therefore, you know, Cambridge is sexist, oh well just how not all men are misogynists just because we live in a sex society, but we need to be aware of gender, we need to be, we need to be countering it as much as possible because that's our responsibility and that is necessary in order to achieve equality. So some bits need more work than others, but until we have actually eliminated all the different manifestations of sexism in our institution, we all unfortunately belong to the sex institution. So informal practices manifest in de facto gender inequality. For example, academic disparities between men and women. There are no regulations that say women should achieve less, but year after year we see women achieving fewer firsts proportionally than men. This year it was 27% of men got a first and only 18% of women. Why does this happen? Why don't more people know about this, first of all? Um, we need to not, first of all, pretend that this doesn't exist. We can't fob it off. So what does it say about Cambridge? Can we say, well, you know, it's just natural, just biological differences playing out? Or do we actually look at this social trend which cultivate women all throughout their lives and then when they get to Cambridge, how Cambridge also cultivates them to make a certain set of people more predisposed to success than others. And that definition of success is itself problematic, as I will deal with. So I strongly dispute the claim that academic performance is biologically rooted. Um, academic performance in the sciences and the arts is massively influenced by social forces. And so there's no um, possible way to determine this right now. So right now I would say that right now we have no methodology nuanced enough to actually decide what's biological and what's social. So until we actually achieve equality, we won't be able to disentangle the social from the biological. So a recent study showed that in, in societies where there's law of gender equality, women actually perform better in math. So the more equal society, the more equal the academic achievement. Our environments do influence how we achieve. So surely the Cambridge University environment is influencing how people achieve as well. So Cambridge University is not at a state of a level playing field where biology plays out on its own. Um, and also, even if it were, then why would, for example, women get fewer firsts in MML and language than men? Where, for example, uh, Dr. Baron Cohen argues that women are inherently better at linguistics and communication. So this doesn't play out, even if we use uh, Dr. Baron Cohen's somewhat dubious framework of men being better at math and women being better at language, it's just inconsistent. 
Um, so I would challenge that that is not a very accurate reflection of nature or of society because nationwide, women actually outperform men at A-levels and at universities around the country. <coughs> Cambridge, I mean, we're all told that Cambridge is special, but now it's special in a new sort of way, in a way which actually perpetuates inequality of men and women in academic performance. So the exam gap is not consistent. Women get a higher proportion of first in bionatsky, but not biochemistry. It's all largely socially created. <coughs> it has to do with how certain courses are taught, the breakdown of different fellows, teaching styles, writing styles, and these are all ways in which social elements are hugely entangled <coughs> in performance. <coughs> so Dr. Byrne Cohen writes in your book, um, The Central Difference, not to plug it, but um, <laughs> it, it, was, it was an interesting read, I'll, I'll give you that, um, that overall intelligence is no better in one sex or another, but the profiles are different between the sexes. So looking at the final gap, we'll have to conclude that Cambridge <coughs> University does not measure overall intelligence. It measures a specific kind of intelligence which is stereotypically masculine in its styles of learning, problem solving, and reading. So one could argue that there's nothing wrong with this. We could say Cambridge University is an institution where we are measuring um, masculine abilities to learn, to teach, to write. And you know, for example, a sprinting race, we, we measure speed but not style. Maybe that's okay, as long as we actually have no claim that we're being objective. As long as we do not claim that we're gender neutral, we can step back and say, actually, we're here to judge men, and if some women fit that role, um, we'll accept them as well. But this is not equality. That is sexism. That's what it's called. So you can say it's okay. You can say it's not wrong. But that is actually sexism, and you'd have to vote um, proposition in that case. So obviously, I don't think that's okay, though. I do think that in order to have an ideal academic community, we need to have a wide range of styles of thinking, of learning, of discussing, of writing. If we want to be a truly progressive academic community, that's what we need. Um, measures of academic ability also are not objective. They are personally influenced. So imagine going to an English literature exam and having some of the questions written in Spanish. And you can't speak Spanish, but you can write a pretty good essay, um, but just not in Spanish. So, so your supervisor starts <coughs> telling you, maybe you should learn Spanish. And actually, it would help you to learn how to speak Spanish, but Imagine you're a woman, and your supervisor's telling you you need to write more like a man, which happens to women again and again, every single year. They're told to write more like men. But there's nothing intrinsically better about writing in Spanish, about writing like a man. You can still write a really good essay, writing as a woman, because you can still communicate your point. So these women, all, you know, all across Cambridge, are being told, either, ch either change your writing style into something that's not intrinsically better, the different, or get lower class marks. <coughs> is that fair? <coughs> I don't think so. So the gender gap in academics is a blatant example of how informal norms and practices lead to an outcome which advantages one gender-related set of norms over another. So there's no biological basis for this happening. <coughs> Studies in general show women performing on par with men, both in reading and in math, in the highest brackets. And so that is what's consistent with a, consi with a steadily growing body of research. Not <coughs> difference, but equality. <coughs> and there are countless other ways that informal trends create unequal gender outcomes. You know, despite the high level of participation of women in sports, we actually do see the sports coverage in student papers as absolutely minuscule. If you want, to, if you want the statistics, contact me. I've been keeping track. It's shameful how little women's sports are covered in Cambridge University. The social culture, pennying, drinking societies, often leads to outcomes which actually hurt women more than they hurt men. I think that's pretty undeniable. And that maybe is an element in which biology, biology does actually have a role. Women who are drunk are taken advantage of, are abused, are raped, are humiliated, and hurt seriously. And I think that's something <coughs> we need to take into account when we see that our university isn't doing anything, <coughs> barely, to counter the severe drinking culture of Cambridge. And also, when we see <coughs> fellows, you know, flirting with students, being <coughs> on students, it's not always harmless. And it's not just instances of this happening, but actually a consistent failure of colleges and faculties to take the steps necessary to make sure that students feel supported, feel empowered, and don't feel unsafe in the place where they're meant to be learning. And we see, and this is institutional sexism for me, yes, you always have individuals 
who are inappropriate, but when the actual institution says, we can't help you, sorry, find somewhere else to eat, find another supervisor, just go off on your own, then that is actually institutional sexism, and that happens. So universities do have a responsibility to counter this, sex, this kind of sexism, and that's um, what brings me to my third point of what institutional sexism is, <coughs> failure to be proactive. And this isn't actually radical or unheard of. This is in line with national gender equality legislation. The 2007 gender duty says that public institutions are required to publish equality impact assessments, which say these are our practices, these are how they impact on women, on black students, on disabled students. And right now the university is actually in contravention to legislature, um, to laws, because they're not publishing these equality impact assessments. And that's something that there is progress slowly being made on, something that KUSU is working on. But the fact that KUSU needs to campaign so hard to get these policies through shows that Cambridge University is not yet at a point where it's ready to consider gender. So that's what I'm calling for. We need to actually be aware of gender in this institution, because right now we're not. And that's causing institutional sexism on all three counts, structural, informal, and failure to be proactive. So what I'm calling for is for the university to take its responsibility to battle sexism seriously and to show a commitment to eliminate sexist practices, formal or informal. So I'll be very pleased if all of you walk out the yes door tonight, but that's actually not what I'm here for. An educated and aware student body is the first step to achieving change in our institution. But that's not all. So go ahead and walk out the yes door tonight, but don't stop there. Because tomorrow you need to walk into your college office and say, excuse me, what are you doing about gender equality? And then you can go ahead and walk down to CUSA offices and join in with the women's union to call for equality impact assessments to be published and for the gender equality scheme to get out of draft form and to actually be passed through the university council. These are steps that the university needs to take, but it hasn't yet. And frankly, I think it's shameful. And there's so many people working so hard on every level of the university to make it happen. But it's not going to happen until we have a student body which is actually asking for it. So please, walk out that door and do that because it's absolutely essential to us as an institution. Thank you. I was speaking here last week, uh, although I had rather less time to prepare last week. I had about two hours, and I spent about a quarter of that getting dressed, and the other half having dinner, and then the remaining quarter drinking. Um, so, and I managed to, to say referenda, referendums instead of referenda, and someone called me a simpleton, so what do you know? Uh, this time I've had rather more time to prepare. Um, I've, I'm going to go through probably three, three main areas. Um, my first will be that if Cambridge was really institutionally sexist, um, why wouldn't the Women's Union be calling for um, specific changes to the structure and institutions of the university um, rather than, uh, than doing uh, what they do, which I'll go into. Um, secondly, I shall be talking about uh, the performance gap between women and men. Um, first, I'll talk, like Natalie did, a little bit about the national uh, performance gap, the national wages gap, um, because I think that would be instructive. Then I'll talk about the performance gap in the university, the admissions gap, and the gap between the, the uh, lower number of female <coughs> professors and fellows of colleges. And then finally, I'll go through the uh, history of Cambridge's uh, institutional sexism, which I, I now believe is, is gone, um, but it, it was rather interesting to research, so I'd like to show, sh share with you some anecdotes. Um, so, um, the QC Women's Union, it doesn't have that much to do. Um, you look at their website, um, I haven't just looked at their website, I, 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 I've, uh, I've seen, seen them speaking at Hustings information. and things. The website's okay. updated, everyone should actually look at it, it's, it's really good. I was good. looking at it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was looking at it yesterday, um, but I haven't, I, like I've, I've seen you speaking at Hustings and things like that. Um, they, they do talk about the pay gap, um, which of course is, doesn't refer to uh, Cam sexism within Cambridge. I don't believe it refers to sexism at all, but I'll go into that. Um, 
They talk about things like uh, stopping violence get w against women, and they say things like violence against women is a shockingly spread problem worldwide. Um, but uh, don't really go into it being a problem in the university. They talk about things like uh, an estimated two-thirds of the illiterate people in the world are women. Um, and this is, this is because there are societies in the world which are indeed sexist um, and don't send girls to school, but of course it has nothing to do with Cambridge. They do talk about two things which do have something to do with Cambridge. Um, one is women's sport, um, which doesn't receive as much financial support from the university um, than, uh, than men's sport does. Uh, now, is this the result of discrimination? Well, there's, there's no evidence the, women, the university deliberately withholds money from women's sports. Um, I'm inclined to, to believe it's historical. And, and I, I think the Women's Union know this, which is why their website doesn't call for any specific policy, um, but instead says they merely want to encourage female students to get involved in sport or uh, to give women's team practical information and to work, uh, to, to look into the way the sports community is represented or they look into uh, coverage of sport in the, in the university newspapers which I can't say I've noticed has been particularly biased myself. Um, so, <laughs> no, seriously, I, there, was, uh, there were articles about women's hockey teams, women's football teams, uh, every week. Um, okay. So, um, I'd like to talk about the performance gap now. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the performance gap uh, nationally in pay. Um, we heard that women get paid £559 less a month. Well, on average, they do. Um, indeed, uh, per hour salaries of uh, women are 17% less than men. Um, I don't, don't believe this is a result of discrimination in the vast majority of cases. I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, because when you, the, the mistake really is to treat uh, all women as identical and all men as identical and just lump them together and say, aha, there is a, a, a statistical gap. Um, but in fact, uh, if you look at various other things, if you, if you break, break, them, break men and women down into different groups, you find different things. For example, um, women, uh, are much more likely to work part-time. Um, this is, uh, is one explanation of uh, why they get paid slightly less on average. Uh, but in fact, within people who worked part-time, women get paid on average more. Um, in the UK, 22 to 29 year olds, uh, the median gender pay gap was less than 1% in 2007. Um, this is according to the Office of National Statistics. Uh, and in the, in the US, the government's uh, National Longitudinal Survey of Youth found uh, the gap between childless women and men uh, between the ages of 27 and 33 is only 2%. Now these we th I think we can put down to random fluctuations. Um, in fact, there are all sorts of things. When you, when you look into them, you find um, really odd things which can't possibly be uh, explained by discrimination. For example, Bangladeshi women, um, on average 27% more than Bangladeshi men. What's the, what's, the result of, what's the cause of this? Well, I don't know, it could be all sorts of things. Um, but it's, 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 <laughs> it's, 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 my point is, it, it could be all, no thanks. It could be all sorts of things, um, cultural um, uh, choices that women make uh, as opposed to men. Who knows? Um, women. <laughs> Cambridge. Sure, I'm coming. I'll get. No, but I find a different way you've opened this subject, and indeed, my thing with it, which is actually not focusing on the debate. I take your point. Um, I, I don't treat the subject as a joke. Um, I, I simply do. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, my, my point is to, to lump all women together and treat them as identical. I think that is, is the real sexism. Um, and if you examine, uh, if, if you look at women who work part time or work, women who work in different sectors of society, women who um, uh, in the, are in the top 10% uh, of earners or the bottom 10% of earners. You find all sorts of things which can't be explained by sexism. Um, women with uh, children, the more children you have, the less you earn. Uh, this, is, this is perfectly uh, reasonable, I suppose, to expect. Um, no, to, ex to expect. Um, 
if you have more if you have more children, you are more likely to work part time, uh, and if you uh, if you work part time, you are less valuable to your employer because they have to train twice as many people. That sort of thing. Um, there are there are rational reasons for this. Uh, lesbians earn more. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting fact. Lesbians earn more per hour on average than single men do. Um, who knows what the reason for this is? But so in, to immediately to immediately attribute to immediately I, I need to move on to immediately attribute uh, differences uh, in pay to to sexism uh, rather jumps the gun, I think. Um, okay, let's look at let's look at uh, the performance gap in the university. Um, where are we? Here we are. Oh, All yes. right. Um, University figures for undergraduates. Uh, we now have approximately 48 or 49 percent of, uh, of uh, undergraduates are, are women. This has increased steadily since women were first admitted, um, and um, it's, it's now hovering around 50 percent. Um, it's hard to measure exactly. In fact, according to the BBC, in 2000, um, more women uh, that were admitted to Cambridge than men for the first time. Um, and so, how much inequality is too much? Is 2% is too much? Is it the result of random fluctuations? Um, Econometri econometrics. Okay. Um, I'm, no, I'm, get, I'm getting to the investor. Okay. Um, we, are, we are told that uh, some subjects have far, far fewer women than men do. Um, this is true. Some subjects have far more um, women than men. Um, mechanical engineering, computer science, ec economics have far more men than women. Um, but other subjects like English, psychology, sociology, um, have uh, more, more women than men. In the university, um, there are more women than men in subjects archaeology, classics, education, English, law, geography, history of art, medicine, MML, oriental studies, SPS, theology, and veterinary medicine. In some subjects, uh, there are almost ten times as many women um, than men. Is this, is this evidence of sexism? Then we have their, their achievement gap. Um, 27%. Are we talking student enrollment? Are we talking faculty and fellows? This is students for the time being, but I will be getting on to that. Um, uh, we have, um, and, and then uh, that's, that's admissions, then in, in terms of achievement, we are told that 27% uh, of men get firsts, but only 18% of women. This is true, but uh, it doesn't hold up in every subject. Um, in fact, let's, let's talk a little about um, the uh, admission of uh, staff, university staff. It, it, it was as far back as uh, 1939. Um, there's a fascinating article by uh, Pamela Jane Smith from the Department of Archaeology um, called uh, Dorothy Garrett as the first woman professor in Cambridge. And she said that in, in 1939, Garrett was admitted to be the Disney professor of archaeology. Um, and there, there was no hint of controversy. The minutes are, are um, according to form for the meeting. Um, although for other meetings, they, uh, they are not according to form. So it suggests that this meeting proceeded fairly uh, without any controversy. And the eight electors met in the usual world way, discussed the uh, candidates and quickly voted for Dorothy Garrett. Um, there wasn't the slightest sign of any disagreement. Um, in fact, uh, Smith writes, Dorothy Garrett was chosen because of her qualifications. She was the best candidate for the position in several different ways. And then actually after that, um, this, this, uh, the, the Vice Chancellor said to the uh, electors, gentlemen, you have presented us with a slight problem because uh, as a professor she became eligible to serve on the Council of the Senate. And all members of the council were, by definition, members of the university. But at that time, women were not allowed to join the university. Um, and uh, this, this could have turned into an awkward situation for the uh, governing body of the university, but it didn't. Um, even as, as far back as 1939, um, women were being appointed solely because of their qualifications. Now, not all women. Uh, the, the, were, were, there are still far fewer uh, women fellows than there are male fellows. Um, I suggest this is possibly a historical... Um, action which will, will fade away gradually since, uh, because, because of course some colleges didn't admit women at all until as late as 1988 um, and fellows are notoriously old so it could take a while to equalise um, <laughs> but uh, so, so, so the, it, it, it's not um, it's not as, uh, as, as obvious, obvi obvious as you might think um, ok so Finally, I want to talk a little about uh, the history. Um, now, in 1897, actually, there was a debate rather similar to this one in the uh, Union Society, although no women were admitted. 
Um, uh, in fact, in fact, um, sexist attitudes were, were well, should, I, should I say, chauvinistic attitudes, because both sides um, thought that it was meet and proper not to admit women, um, because they wanted to be able to speak freely. Um, the, the motion was, this House strongly condemns the recommendation of the Women's Degree Syndicate, who had uh, recommended that women be admitted and given all the same rights as, uh, as men. Um, one, one president of the, universe, uh, of the uh, Union, Philip Whitwell Wilson, um, thought that the proposals to admit women would result in a long course of agitation, warfare and strife. Um, <laughs> And, and then the, the, the motion, mil, thou, thou, about a thousand people were admitted to the room um, and the motion was uh, voted, uh, get, uh, the motion to admit women was voted down by the students by about a thousand to 138. Um, so then, uh, it, it was, sexist attitudes were, were prevalent in the university and then when the, uh, ten days later, the university senate uh, had their vote and MAs arrived from across the country to vote and uh, MAs who voted... Uh, for the, for the motion to admit women were booed and called traitor and goat. Um, and those who voted against it were, were praised with phrases like, well voted. Um, and across the road from Senate House, there were enormous banners like, get thee to Girton, Beatrice, get thee to Newnham, there's no place for you maids, and Cambridge expects every MA, M, to do his duty. Uh, no woman shall come within a mile of, of, of my courts. And the motion uh, for the Senate was defeated um, by about... Uh, uh, 1,707 to 661, slightly less, but still pretty uh, a, a landslide. Uh, 200 undergraduates, uh, armed with an effigy of a new woman, this was 1897, remember, uh, stormed the closed gates of Newnham College, uh, and then for some reason dispersed peacefully, shouting, three cheers for Newnham. Um, <laughs> Girton, Girton College was founded in 1869 um, for just for women. Newnham was founded in 1871. Women got the right to, achieve, to visit, attend lectures in the 1870s, uh, to sit in examinations in, the, in 1881, this was three years before Oxford, uh, to be awarded degrees in 1948. Uh, this was 28 years after Oxford. Um, in fact, when, uh, when women were finally given the uh, privilege of being awarded degrees, um, as the university taught them, uh, Varsity ran a headline in, uh, Saturday, on Saturday the 28th of October 1948, which I came across just by chance um, while looking at some old copies of Varsity. Uh, 70 years of bitter struggle for equality for women in the university culminated triumphantly when Her Majesty the Queen received her honorary degree last Thursday as the first, person ever to, uh, the first woman ever, ever to uh, achieve a degree in Cambridge. Um, but then, since then, um, Girton, Girton admitted men in uh, 1979. Maudlin, uh, Corpus was the second to last college to admit women in 1980. Uh, Maudlin admitted women in 1988, they were the last. Um, and I don't see any institutions which uh, are, are clearly, um, by their design, sexist against women. Um, there are, well, I suppose we still have women's colleges. I don't think they're sexist. Um, Jemaine Greer was a, was a fellow of one until she resigned for opposing the uh, admission of a transsexual uh, person to a fellowship. Um, but... Um, I, I have no problem with women's colleges. Um, I, I would have, have no problem with men's colleges. Um, uh, most of them are mixed. I think that's a perfectly reasonable situation. Um, the only organisation we still have which seems to make a, a distinction between men and women, um, most people just get on with it. The only organisation we still have is the Women's Union. Um, now, any organisation like this, once it exists, is obviously going to make self-preservation uh, its highest priority. Um, so, in practice, they can't admit that there are no longer any institutions which are by design sexist. There might be sexist fellows. Um, there is, of course, a procedure, if you come across a sexist fellow, uh, for dealing with it or getting a new supervisor, etc. Um, and and, and the, the Women's Union does provide many laudable things like welfare and advice. Um, but these are small incidents of sexism. They're not, not institutional. And I, I propose the proposition's case is unhampered by evidence um, both that the uh, gender pay gap is caused by sexism, or the admissions gap is caused by sexism, the performance gap is caused by sexism, when they could be caused by all sorts of other things. Uh, and in fact, there's no, there's no reason to suppose that they are caused by sexism. Um, so, we've moved on since 1897, we've moved on since 1948, we've moved on since 1988, it was 20 years ago, come on. Um, I beg to oppose the motion. Thank you.
Miguel very much indeed for his speech. We now throw the debate open to the floor, and you have your chance to have your say, both for or against the motion. So, can I first ask, are there any speakers in favour of tonight's motion in the House? Down the front. Uh, Laura Vigil, Hughes College. Uh, Mr. Hadlow, would you not agree that this institution is for educational purposes? Yes. Then would you not also agree that the institutions of the institutions, such as the Women's Union, is also for educational purposes? Not necessarily. So you would disagree that it is against the it is not reasonable for an institution such as the Women's Union to educate the young members of this university in social issues such as violence against women, such as sure. the issues that we I'm very lucky, I have very good education, I have had good health. And it is important to me that I remember that I'm lucky and that I'm educated that other women have not had my advantages and are not able to be standing here today discussing this issue. <coughs> so I, please, would like to thank <coughs> Natalie and the Women's Union for their issues, which you so dismiss. Thank you. Thank you. Can we hear a speech against the motion? Gentlemen in the gallery. Uh, Natalie, uh, could you tell yeah, me... Yeah, can we have your name and college, please? Oh, no. Guy Hayward, Trinity College. Natalie, could you tell us what it is to write like a man? Yes, it is a problematic category. Um, it is not biological. As I was saying, it is socially constructed. So, in general, a lot of men have a different style of writing from a lot of women. And it's something there have actually been quite a lot of scientific studies in to try to find trends in between. In general, one could say that a more masculine style of writing has to do with law of style in terms of being less discursive, <coughs> less examining the issue as a whole, and then sort of navigating a pathway through it, and more just about kind of taking one side and running with it. There are plenty of women with this writing style. There are plenty of men with a different kind of writing style. There are people who don't have either writing style. But you do see general trends, and that's my main point there are general trends in society when they interact with certain values, certain norms, certain policies, actually end up to the disadvantage of one gender more than two another. Like I was saying, with childcare, it also disadvantages men, but it disadvantages women more. Can we take a speech in abstention of motion? Over there. College before you speak. Can we have another speech in favour of the motion? Uh, down front. Uh, also, Lieutenant uh, Murray Edwards. 
I think that when you discuss whether or not Cambridge as an institution is sexist, um, while admission statistics are very important, there are other factors that play in quite to a very great extent. And I think one of those factors is just um, the importance that tradition plays in this university. As you have a very um, very elaborately outlined um, the very short uh, length of time that women have been around. And the fact is that in a university where, where we put such great value in traditions, it's quite clear that those traditions were created by men. And it takes, it doesn't take any more than just looking around this room and looking at that wall, that wall, that wall, and seeing that, you know, a lot of great people that have come from this place have been men. And to some extent, that makes it quite difficult for women to feel that this is a place for them. They are admitted, but uh, under the circumstances that kind of, um, of, of adjusting to a norm and a standard that has been created by men. And this is a very big challenge for an old institution, but I think that it's about, um, that it needs a more proactive kind of, uh, you need more proactivity in that you need to, in that you need to create you need to expand and create different standards and not just stick to the old ones that have existed. Yeah. 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 Um, well, yeah, sure, sure. Um, I think the, the fact that this room is uh, full of photographs of men shows that Cambridge and the Union were once upon a time institutionally sexist, um, up till a fairly recent time. Um, although the Union has had, I think it's 27 female presidents. Um, so I don't think it's, it's institutionally sexist anymore. It was once. Um, then you said that we need, uh, that this lingers socially, um, and that women might still feel um, that they have to conform to some sort of standard. Um, that will go, but it's, I don't think it's institutional, and therefore I don't think we can get rid of it by an obvious policy of doing this, making this change to, to the structures of Cambridge. Um, and I think it will, it will, as much as it still exists, I think it will go. Yes, but it is status quo at the moment. Can we take another speech again to the motion? Um, over here. Kieran, this is John. Um, following on from the question of what it is to write like a man, would Ms. Iris have to cite a source for the claim that lots of women are frequently told by their supervisors to write more like a man? <coughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the Stone Ages. And, and basically, the way he's gone about talking about this debate, he actually reminds me of 
of the funny dullies in which he said he'd already left this university. <laughs> and um, perhaps we could go back to his, his gentleman's, sorry, the conservative part. <laughs> stereotypical masculinity imposed <coughs> upon men. Men are not all the same. Men do not write in a certain way. So say you're being told to write like a man, when that case men are also being told to write like a man. <laughs> <laughs>
speech, you have, have one more speech, you have another speech against the motion. <coughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Basically, I think you're talking about the man and the total evidence being found about a proposition. Um, I was in a position when I was an undergraduate with a male civilian partner who was told we've had quite enough um, from you men. Can you please be silent so the girls can talk? Um, and I just, I have a real problem with, oh yes, no, my, my supervisor told me this. It's not about anecdotal evidence. You haven't provided any evidence at all, like substantial evidence, that came to the institution in Texas. I don't believe that it is. And I'd like to hear from you some actual concrete facts that, that prove, as Hugo said, you know, many of the points that you made are not necessarily about the system at all. So I'd really like to hear from you. I think it could be right, but I'd like to hear from you why is it sexist? How is it sexist? Give some facts. institutionally sexist, what they're actually saying is that the people who make up Cambridge are sexist. And I've only been here a short while, but it's not struck me yet that the place is absolutely jam-packed full of sexist individuals, neither is a majority nor indeed a significant minority. So I'd be interested to hear what you say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have time for a final speech in favour of the motion. Uh, yeah, down the front. Hi, um, Ellie Trinity. Um, Hugo has brought up two apparently separate issues, which are the performance gap in the men statistically in every subject, even subjects like English, where more women take it, get first. And he's also brought up the fact that um, more professors are male. Apparently, the fact that we now admit women and women are going to be admitted foreseeable future, is that this will just happen over time. As more women get degrees over time, more women will have professors. If women aren't getting as many firsts as men, that's not going to happen, because they're not going to proceed on to postgraduate study. So I think that you can't separate the two at all. And we have one final speech against the motion. And Bernard, Bernard Travis, the Guardian And we heard the proposition talk about masculine standards and masculine intelligence. And my, my question that I'd like the proposition to explain is how and oh, why does it propagate institutional sexism to promote standards and ideas that at the moment are, are considered to be traditionally masculine? For instance, in, like, tw in 20 years past, say, it might have been considered traditionally masculine for all boys to go into the sport. Um, and to have propagate, to propagated that then to propagate the idea that everyone should do sports um, would, would have been seen as sexist, but now say uh, that the balance is different. So why, why is, is the, why is the um, quality of, say, aggression or assertiveness um, necessarily institutionally sexist? Why are you propagating that and um, keep on institutional sexism per se? Because we live in the present, it advantages one sex over another right now, today, and that is where we're living right now. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Bernard, and thank you to all the floor speakers. I'm sorry that not everyone's ever got the chance to comment, but we have to move on. Um, to return to the main speakers in the debate tonight, 
to conclude the case for the proposition, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Jermaine Gray. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, um, one of the uh, traditions of this place is that you mustn't be too serious. The masculinist tradition holds that this place is a place of male display, which <coughs> explains most of what Hugo was up to, <laughs> <laughs> which explains why he told us things we didn't want to know about the state of his clothing and when he ate and drank. And it is true that the proposition have departed from tradition by being very serious. This is normally uh, a cause of much derision in this place. And we have not been derided this evening because the composition of this audience is, I think, at least half female. Something is changing. Heaven forbid that the Cambridge Union should become a place where people say what they really feel. <laughs> now, it's a bit like teaching boys and girls in high school. What one notices is that when boys want to ask a question, it's because they're going to impress their henchmen. Hugo is a very good case in point. <laughs> and so they say things they don't mean, some things they don't understand. The girls, on the other hand, tend to sit in pairs, holding on to each other for support, and they tend to ask questions to which they really, truly want an answer. And it's a different approach to education altogether, and it makes the women the young women, in my view, extremely vulnerable. It is also against the rules to get anywhere in discussing a subject in this house. It is against the rules to have your wit erected and your understanding improved. And I'm immensely grateful to the speaker who pointed out that the paradigm of masculinity which is being peddled by this institution is just as difficult of achievement for men as it is for women. This is the most important statement that has been made tonight. And I wanted, as I think I can be allowed to do, given my advanced years, and the fact that I am still a member of the university, and I'm a special supervisor in English at Newnham, so come by all means if you'd like to be taught by me. What I'd like to say is that there can be no doubt that Cambridge is a masculinist institution. Now, if that means the same thing as sexist, I'm not entirely sure. <coughs> if sexism means discriminating against people simply on the grounds of their biological sex, then I think it's probably true to say that Cambridge no longer does this in quite as crass a manner as it used to. But it would be absurd, on the other hand, to argue that Cambridge is somehow exempt from the sexism that flows through our society at large. But at this moment, I would like to actually think about what this place is and why all of us are here. Because it is a very strange and abnormal place. As you all know, it was founded, this institution, piecemeal, in order to educate a celibate male clergy. That was what it was here for. And that explains its architecture. It doesn't quite explain this architecture, or quite a lot more of the architecture, which is what I call clergyman's wet dream architecture. <laughs> Uh, the fake Gothic which bedevils our streets. But you can see that what is being harked back to is this bastion of monasticism. And that explains the curious architecture of the colleges with their rooms, with their sets of rooms, and the extraordinary, the extraordinary resort 
to that now bisexual entity known as a bedder. This was a place where young gentlemen were waited on hand and foot by members of the lower orders. And we were special in Cambridge because bedders were women, whereas scouts were, as I understand it, men in Oxford. So there's another little peculiarity about the Fenland Polytechnic that you might like to think about. In 1635 we are told there was an edict that the women should all be over 50 because the young men showed an alarming propensity to fall in love with them. <laughs> it was not that they were feared that they would be used as prostitutes. Monastic institutions have never been nervous about prostitution. <laughs> but they have always been nervous about falling in love and monogamy. As such, the university was essentially hierarchical. And we could argue for hours about whether the building of hierarchies is a hardwired male characteristic and whether it is completely foreign to female ways of interacting and organising themselves. I happen to be an adherent of the heresy known as essentialism and I happen to think that these differences are real and that they're important because I think if we are all to take on the masculinist paradigm we've absolutely had it. We will not survive. In this hierarchy, we begin with the juniors. We begin with the freshmen, the seniors, the graduates, the tutors, the senior tutors, the professors and all the other little bits and pieces of seniority and accolade that are added on. And everybody is moving up <coughs> the phallic pyramid just the way they do in the corporate world. It is a cruel system and it is cruelest to men because it works by exclusion. It works by forcing people to fail, by actually making the pinnacle of the pyramid ever smaller and more exclusive. It begins at the very beginning with the exclusion of people from higher education, whether men or women, working class, whatever reason, uh, disabled, etc., and on and on. Our education has been, for centuries, a process of systemic elimination and the creation of a small elite. <coughs> on that point, are, are, are you saying that um, academic meritocracy is inherently sexist, or, or what? No, I'm not saying that, Hugo. Just, sure. uh, <coughs> I haven't even made that connection so far. I'm talking about what I did say, which you might have misunderstood, <coughs> is that the I call the structure phallic. <laughs> <laughs> which probably made you think of sex. <laughs> but I was, really, I was really referring to an archetype. Uh, the universe is divided into uh, projections and holes. I was talking about a projection. <laughs> now, later on, perhaps, thing. in the bar, I'll make it more graphic for you. <laughs> ideally in a single male individual. But that single male individual has other male individuals whose sole aim is to topple him from that pinnacle. As far as I'm concerned, this corporate paradigm is one we cannot live with either. And it may very well be one that Cambridge has to rethink. Nowadays, that person at the top of that column can be a woman. But in order to get there, it has, that person has to deploy the same behaviours, the same empire building, the same elimination of competition, regardless of sex, because there's no other way of getting there. That basic structure then can't be altered by the mere admission of women. What happens in a masculinist institution when women are admitted is that the women are changed long before the institution is changed. In fact, you could argue that the institution was incapable of systemic change because it, as was remarked by another perspicacious speaker, indeed Hugo in this case, most institutions have as their primary intention self-perpetuation. So women are introduced to Cambridge, but Cambridge makes very little in the way of allowance. 
Now, when you come to my college, Newnham, one of the things that fascinates me, and I don't know enough about it, is that the very architecture was reconceived. It is different. And the notion of how the college community should be built is also different. Newnham didn't have bedders. I'm a bit confused as to exactly how they did get all their young ladies in and out of their corsets and keep their voluminous linen clean. But it certainly was a completely different feeling and the, it doesn't have a campus, it doesn't have a chapel. We, we say a Latin grace for reasons which I simply do not understand. A sort of transvestism overcomes us at that point. <laughs> And what I would say is that women will not enter Cambridge unless they have already espoused a set of ideals and indeed learnt a set of behaviours that actually make them eligible for entry to this place. Now, what will they have accepted? Well, one of the things they will have accepted is competitiveness. They will have had to fight one way or another to get here and they will have had to jump through hoops. They'll have had to produce the kind of immediate display of intellectual accomplishment that impresses people. The kind of thing you have to do on University Challenge. You will remember that poor old New Hall managed to score 35 in University Challenge. Now why was that? Because they were stupid or because they didn't respond to the prompt. They couldn't produce what they knew at the first prompt. They weren't so ready to display, is one way of putting it. Now, Richard Dawkins is someone who has my respect, except that I discovered that he thought maybe University Challenge would be a better preparation, a uh, better academic preparation than actually going to university. Which I think was an factuous thing to say, and if he'd actually meant it, it would have really disqualified women. If, you, if like me, you watch University Challenge, much as you might watch <coughs> spiders mating on the window, <laughs> it is a dreadful experience because you are asking yourself constantly what the women are doing there. And the men answer questions and do that little thing of grinning at each other because they just... <laughs> And they're really getting off on it. And very often they make the poor woman the head of the team so they can all give her the answers. And she says, nominate whoever, because she hasn't quite understood the word. I could tear my hair if I thought it was important. But the degree to which we've accepted that that is the way you deploy knowledge is an example of the way we have absorbed the kind of this kind of university's paradigm. Competitiveness and single-mindedness, two things that women at large are not good at. We hear all the time that women are underconfident. I know as a teacher that my students work too hard. I beg them not to work so hard. I say to them, it's a three-hour exam. Think about it. Think of the subject. They're going to have to ask one, two, three, four, five, if you must be extravagant. <laughs> Cover them and you've got to take. Oh no, oh no, I've got to do the whole thing, I've got to read the whole syllabus, I've got to know it back to front. As you go down to the, uh, to the exams, they're, they're reading and scribbling notes 16 hours a day. They're exhausted. They get into the exam and they know far too much. They're shoveling vast amounts of stuff and they've got, they waste a lot of time trying to compress it into this sound bite of an answer that you can write in one hour. Why, don't, why can women not trust me that this is a gamble, that it can be an informed gamble, there's usually only a few horses in any race that have got a chance of winning it? You can cover it easy. The 10-week term, the 10-week term for women is a challenge. You've really got to cram it's got nothing to do with understanding the meaning of life. You're not here to do that. You're here to pass an exam. <coughs> now, people who are idealistic about education say, oh, what a cynical view. But life is a series of exams, as they'll find when they leave this place. There's a deadline every day. I've had three deadlines this week and had to submit copy to The Guardian and wherever. And every time I do it, I could, I could be told, I could 
be told or not told that they won't need me anymore because it wasn't exciting enough or good enough or the advertisers didn't like it or I'm just too old and they're sick of me or whatever. Life is unfair and universities are a good way of finding out just how unfair they are. But for girls, that sudden death playoff, that 10-week thing, is a different, I would say, a different kind of challenge. So when you're asking, you know, why do women get <coughs> second-class degrees all the time? Is it because the system is weighted against them? Well, you can put it another way and you can say, look, you only get a first if you're a psychopath. <laughs> On that point, why is it that national... You won't get a first, don't worry, Hugo. No, why, is it that <laughs> why is it that nationally... Um, it's not, it's not the case in Cambridge, but nationally more women get first and two ones than men. Well, we're not talking about the University of Central England, dear boy. <laughs> we're talking about this place. I don't know, I mean, I, about other universities I can't tell you. But doesn't it rather expose your argument? No. <laughs> uh, but we could talk about other universities at length, but it's not our subject. Our subject is, is Cambridge institutionally sexist. And what I'm saying is that Cambridge is institutionally masculinist. You have to be able to meet these criteria of extreme competitiveness, but also you have to be a train spot <coughs> to get a first. You have to blot out the rest of the world and you have to behave in a way which, psychopathic was the wrong word, I should have said socio sociopathic, that w firsts are abnormal. And it's interesting that employers would rather someone with a good 2-1 than someone with a brilliant and rather enigmatic first class honours which his tutor or his examiner just actually couldn't understand. <laughs> I mean this university encourages people to gamble, to ex exceed themselves, to be overreachers and we have probably as many failures as we do enormous successes and you could argue genetically that women are more likely to fall within the range of normal <coughs> to one to two uh, it's one way of putting it, but I would explain it also by the different attitude of women towards this kind of test. What is this kind of test meant to elicit? And we already know that there are many men who will find this kind of test just as intimidating, just as um, alien, and who will not do well. And which is why for years we've had all this struggle to actually change the structure of university courses a struggle that Cambridge resisted to a large extent. We still have the tripos standing there in the humanities. It's got pretty wobbly. You can put all sorts of other things in, but in my subject, it maintains its rocky exterior. It's still the same old three-legged stool. Even when Cambridge finally succeeds in appointing as many female <coughs> professors as male, it will still be institutionally masculinist. <coughs> Margaret Thatcher, remember, was the only man in her cabinet. <laughs> what they used to say. The fact that some disciplines now feature as many female students as men or more doesn't change the basic masculinism of the system. But there is one interesting trend, and you might like to observe, that as women begin to dominate in any university discipline, it begins to lose prestige. And that is not simply because men don't give it prestige. <coughs> Unfortunately, the misogyny that we should be worrying about is not the misogyny of men, which is only to be expected. It's the misogyny of women, <coughs> which some people here tonight have already made reference to. Our misogyny, mine. <coughs> All right, so who becomes a professor? Well, at this university, 6% of the professors are female. But to be a professor, you have to do... You have to behave in a special way. You have to be more interested in power than you are in teaching. And you have to have that focus from the beginning. If you spend too many contact hours with students, you do not advance in the academic world. I'm afraid. It's an, as far as I'm concerned, it's an iron rule. Management is the art of taking credit for other people's work. And women are bad at it. Why? because they do what they do because they love doing it. They teach because they love teaching. 
Ambition is about what will happen in the future. Ambition is about projection into another place. It's jammed tomorrow. But you live your life in the here and the now. If you love teaching, you will teach rather than become a professor. Maybe we need to reorganise all our universities so that the actual basis in which the teaching is done is changed, so that we escape from the trammels of the phallic structure, of the corporate structure, and actually enter into a student body which is where everyone is a student, one man, one vote, a student body that defines itself. But if I argue in these terms, you will understand that what I'm saying to you is that the very notion of a university is institutionally masculinist. And it might be time for us to start thinking in a completely <coughs> different way now that we understand that we will all need to be constantly in education all our lives. We cannot now graduate and be done with because every generation has to tool up to understand what is going on with knowledge and knowledge transmission in our time. <coughs> our schools should be open 24-7. Our universities should be the centre of our communities and not strange Gothic fantasies by the edge of a beautiful river kept clean and tidy by an army of <coughs> underpaid servants. And be aware of one thing, that within our university, the work done by women is characteristically valued as le of less worth than the work done by men. And I'm talking about from the ground up, not simply within the teaching community. So, that's really all I have to say. Now, you can decide that I have lost my own case because I have argued not that the university is sexist, the word strikes me as too blunt to use, but that it is masculinist. And I would accept that for Newnham to exclude men is a sexual discrimination, which legally we can only continue doing because of the inequalities in the Cambridge situation. The EC will force us to admit men at such time as it is understood by the international community that women in Cambridge have reached parity. Now, if you're looking for an objective standard, that's one that you might think about. Thank you. the case for the opposition today, I'd like to welcome Simon Bergen. Thank you very much. Um, so it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I've been listening with uh, a lot of interest to the arguments on both sides and learning something tonight. And uh, the first point I want to make is I think that the topic, the motion, that we're debating uh, shouldn't be treated with flippancy uh, and shouldn't be treated in any dismissive way uh, because it has a very, a very serious history behind it. I'm going to be opposing the motion uh, because of the wording of the motion. So the wording of the motion, I just need to remind you, is that this House believes that Cambridge University is institutionally sexist. So we have to look at the word institutionally as part of the, the, the motion, and the word is. And academics are famously uh, pedantic, but I'm going to basically argue that it all hinges on that small word is, because if, if the motion was this House believes that Cambridge University was institutionally sexist, then I would, be, I would uh, have no hesitation in, in supporting the motion. <coughs> Uh, Hugo has already outlined some of that history, the history of sexism in this, in this university. 
I'm going to just briefly touch on uh, some of those historical examples because I think they are an embarrassment, they're reprehensible, uh, they are part of our historical legacy and we have to think about the continuing Im impact of that history. But let's just remind ourselves what was going on. I'm just going to pick out half a dozen historical milestones uh, in Cambridge University. 1881, <coughs> women were allowed to take the Tripos exam, but they were not allowed to uh, have a degree. They were simply given certificates for having attended or passed the Tripos exam, but no, no degree. That was 1881. 1921, women were allowed to attend lectures, but they were not allowed to serve on the governing body. It's as if you had a big sign on the door saying women are not allowed in this governing body. To me, that's a, it's an embarrassment. If it was a sign of any equivalence <coughs> towards a, a racial group or a group um, with disability, we would all be <coughs> outraged. And we should be equally outraged that it happened towards women. 1945, uh, women were not allowed to exceed more than 20% of the student population. That was a university ruling, so women were allowed in, um, but, uh, but they couldn't exceed one-fifth of the student body. It's hard to imagine the university governing body making up these kinds of rules, but that is part of our history. 1948, so this is the, the, the date that we're meant to celebrate. Um, it was celebrated as the 50th anniversary in 1998. Here we are on the 60th anniversary. But in 1948, women were finally allowed to be students for degrees. And they were also, also allowed to uh, sit on the governing body to serve, uh, to govern um, this, this institution. Now notice what I've said all the way through this history is about women being allowed to do certain things. So we had men deciding what was and wasn't permissible. Personally, as a man, I find this um, embarrassing, shameful, uh, the fact that we have men opposing the motion and women proposing the motion I don't think should be taken as anything significant because I personally oppose sexism wherever we find it in society and our, the history of our institution is full of sexism. 1956, male and female students were finally allowed to take exams in the same room. So the university was overcoming some of its fears about what might happen <laughs> if you put men and women in the same room to take exams. It was only very recent, 1987, when Cambridge University adopted the Equal Opportunities Policy. So it really is very, very recent. Um, again, shameful that it took so long after centuries of the university's existence that equal opportunities were seen as something that we should be striving for. And here we are in 2008, as I say, the 60th anniversary of women being admitted for degrees. And now we are questioning, asking the question, is Cambridge as an institution still sexist? Well, I would argue, and this is where I come to that small word, is, that if we look at what Cambridge is today rather than what it was, that certainly at the undergraduate level of admissions um, in terms of who is studying here, there is no longer any clear evidence for sexism. So the reason I accepted the invitation to talk against the motion is I think it's a very serious allegation to call somebody sexist or racist or discriminating in any other way, but you should make the allegation if you have specific evidence. And my evidence that I'm going to turn to, apologies for the dryness of it, is statistics about university admissions at undergrad. So let's just focus at the undergraduate level and look to see what's happening. Hugo's already mentioned that overall, the statistics for male and female admissions is now about 50-50. 51% um, male, 49% female, using the 2007 <coughs> statistics published in the reporter. If you then try and, uh, so, so on the surface, it looks like the university is now equal in terms of opening its doors to both sexes <coughs> and, uh, and who, who gets accepted. On that point, yeah. isn't that also only partly because there are two females 
Yale colleges, when you actually look at the breakdown of, of how many women versus men go to different colleges, the, the mixed sex colleges do admit less women than men. Um, this is a good point that uh, some people have raised that there are, there are uh, some colleges which are just for women, so that's creating more places for women in, in the university. There are no longer any colleges just for men. So it may be that, uh, that the, the only reason we've achieved parity at undergraduate level admissions is because of these two or three uh, colleges that are just for women. Uh, I, would like to, I would like to think that we haven't yet finished this historical journey, that if, there were, if, if all the colleges were mixed, that the university doesn't have any institutional discrimination against the number of women that are being admitted. Yeah. Yeah, but we, I mean, we, have to, we have to keep in mind that when admission happens, uh, I've been on the other side of the desk where interviewing candidates, we're not uh, consulting the law when we're looking at individual candidates. So what, we have faced with, what we're faced with when we are, as it were, admitting male or female students is who applies and then who gets offered a place. And it's not by reference to a government statute which says make sure that every other candidate you admit should be male or female to, to make sure that the figures end up as 50-50. I think what we're looking at when we, when we see the statistics is the end result of the admissions process. What I'm impressed by is that the number of male and female applicants, the percentage of male and female applicants to Cambridge at undergraduate level is about 50-50. Point of information, sir. Yeah. If you just stated that you're not quite sure that we've finished our historical journey, then yeah. why is the basis of your argument tonight that you don't agree with the verb is in the present tense? Well, what I'm trying to uh, identify is where is there any evidence that Cambridge remains <coughs> institutionally sexist? And I'm starting with the undergraduate process. Point of information again, yeah. sir. If your point about the admission statistic being the main one that you're basing your argument about the present tense not being sexist, and you're saying that you think you, or you would agree that because we need to maintain the all women colleges, that's what's building up the statistic. No, I don't, think, I, don't, no I don't think we need to maintain all women colleges. There are some colleges which choose to remain all women. And if they didn't remain all women, you wouldn't have your statistic for disagreement. I, I, would, I, would, I, would, dis I would dispute that. I mean, I th we, we haven't done the experiment to talk as a scientist. If those, th if those two or three all women colleges didn't exist anymore, uh, it's, it's not clear to me that, uh, that the 50-50 ratio would change. Uh, that we may, we may still have a 50-50 ratio at undergraduate level. And I'm taking as a starting point, just to sort of continue, that the 50-50 ratio indicates to me that there is no discrimination at the point of entry into the university. I then wanted to sort of, I'll, I'll, if, if I could just get through this part and I hope to come back to your question. Um, we can then analyse what's going on subject by subject. And Hugo pointed out that there are some subjects where more women are accepted and some subjects where more men are accepted. And the breakdown that I looked at in the, in the 2007 figures, it's very fortunate that all this is transparent. It's on the web uh, that um, in social sciences it's pretty much 50-50. It's actually slightly more women than men, 52% women, 48% men. But something very interesting happens when you compare arts and sciences. Uh, in fact, the arts and sciences um, diverge. That in arts, 60% of students are women, 40% male. And in sciences, 60% are male, 40% female. Now, to me, I'm interested in what's going on. If Overall, o over the whole university, we have, as it were, parity in admissions. Why are we seeing differences in the sex ratio between arts and sciences? So I then look a little bit closer at the statistics, in particular at what's going on within science. Turns out the picture is actually very interesting because there are some sciences where we still have pretty much close to parity 
and I'll pick out medicine as an example, which is 53% female students, 47% men. I'd also pick out natural sciences, which again is close to 50-50, it's actually 55-45, 55% um, male, 45% female, but these may not be significant differences. Veterinary science, overwhelmingly female, 81% female, 19% male. So this is the first indication that women within science are not choosing sciences in a sort of uniform way. There's a, a massive trend for women to move towards veterinary science, 81%. Now let's look at some of the other sciences which show the opposite pattern. Computer science, engineering and mathematics. So computer science is 90% male, right? 10% female. Engineering, 81% male, 19% female. Mathematics, 72% male, 28% female. So we've got this paradox that at the point of entry, we can see 50-50. Across the whole university, we can see 50-50. And when we put individual degree subjects under the microscope, we see a divergence, particularly in computer science, mathematics and engineering, where many more males are applying and getting places. And in medicine and veterinary science, uh, more women are choosing to, to study those degrees. So now we have to raise, come back to the point of the motion. Is there any sign of institutional sexism which might account for these differences in sex ratio? And uh, my argument is that uh, what we're seeing is a difference in sex ratio, but I'm very hard pressed to say that the sex ratio is the result of sexist uh, institutional <coughs> policies. What we can say, just being very descriptive, is that many more males are applying for mathematics, computer science and engineering, and many more female students are applying for veterinary science, and to some extent medicine. So it can't be the case that uh, men and women differ in their scientific aptitude, but they're choosing different branches of science to study. Now I'm using the word choice because I think that's an alternative interpretation of these statistics. One view would be that there's much more sexism in mathematics, computer science and engineering, and that we should really look at what's going on um, at, the, at the admissions process in those three disciplines. Uh, it turns out that the admissions in those three disciplines exactly mirrors the percentage of males and females who apply. So if we were to look for sexism, why are so few women applying for computer science? We'd have to not look at Cambridge, but we'd have to look at, at what happens before Cambridge at school and right through uh, earlier, earlier education, leading to this paradox that only 10% of women apply to do computer science and very similar minorities apply to do mathematics and engineering. Oh, that's yeah. Um, I'll, I'll respond to that very briefly. Um, you know, I think if, if, there, are, if there are stereotypes um, about different subjects, you know, that, that English is somehow easier than mathematics or less work than mathematics, I think, you know, there's no truth to these stereotypes. If anyone actually tries to study in any of these disciplines, they find that any discipline is, is tough going, involves hard work, that there isn't an easy, an easy path in university. And I think these are simply stereotypes. So I want to um, sort of come back to this question about uh, the, the, the uneven sex ratio in certain subjects. Personally, I'm not convinced that they arise as the result of sexism. They may well reflect, and this is an alternative view, uh, what students are choosing to study. And remember, all we're talking about is is statistics about what percentage of men and women 
are choosing to study one subject or another. But if it's to do with choice, that may reflect interests. And uh, one interpretation, which doesn't fit the sexist one, I don't think, is that maybe female scientists are choosing to study the more people-centered sciences or the more animal-centered scientists which are involved in, um, in making a difference to other people's lives or other an animals' lives, <coughs> medicine and veterinary science, and maybe more men are choosing to study the, what we might call impersonal sciences of computer science, engineering and mathematics where people are not the center of it. And this may simply reflect a difference on average in interests. I want to pick up on something that Natalie said about uh, my views to do with the psychology of men and women. I don't think that the differences between men and women are to do with aptitude or ability, but there may be differences on average in interests. Because after all, to study mathematics at undergraduate level or to pursue it for a career means you really have to be interested in numbers per se. <coughs> Not necessarily how numbers are going to be applied, but just the sheer beauty of the patterns of numbers. Now that may be some people's interest, it may not be other people's interest. So we may be seeing differences in sex ratio reflecting differences in interest. On that point, sure. um, why are women interested in getting fewer first in subjects they are interested in? Um, <laughs> so what I, what I started off by saying tonight was that I've learned a few things tonight. I've learned about the, the difference in the percentage of men and women getting firsts. And I think this is a very serious issue. I, to my mind, there should, if, if admissions uh, for men and women are reflecting equally able students, which I think they are, you can look at GCSEs, you can look at A-levels, you can look at the number of points on your UCAS form. There's no difference at the point of admission. So I think we can assume that men and women at the point of admission uh, are equal in aptitude or ability. So if we're finding a difference three years later in the percentage of men and women getting first, we do need to look at that. We need some serious research into what's going on, subject by subject. You know, you gave the example of uh, students being told, as it were, to write like a man. If that's going on, I think that's um, completely unacceptable. You know, I would like to weed out examples of sexism wherever we find them. I don't think there's any room for complacency in an institution that's had our kind of history. And where we find examples of sexism, we should weed them out. You know, we've also heard some examples from spe speeches from the floor uh, of sexism. Um, one speaker talked about the law faculty trying to make a complaint about um, her supervisor um, and uh, finding it impossible to make the complaint about men and women getting uh, equal attention in supervision. You know, these are specific examples of sexist behaviour and we need to weed them out. So I'm not here to defend Cambridge University as, um, as non-sexist in terms of its individuals, but the motion that we're debating is, is there any institutional sexism in Cambridge? What I've tried to argue at the undergraduate level, running out of time, is that I can't see any evidence, specific evidence, that could support that allegation. And it is a very serious allegation, just like racism is, or just like any form of, of violence is. Um, very briefly, we haven't talked about other levels within the university, lecturer level, professorial level, and I think we are a long way from reaching the ideal state of this university where we would see that 50-50 ratio at professorial level and at lectureship level. Germaine mentioned at professorial level it's only 6% uh, of women who are professors, which is appalling. It may reflect what Hugo was calling the residue of, of our history. I think you called it historical accident. But anyway, it's a residue of our history and anything we can do to fast forward to accelerate that change so we achieve 50-50 equal opportunities at professorial and lectureship level, we should be doing. So there's no room for complacency. But I, I want to sort of conclude by saying Cambridge was sexist. I can't see any specific examples institutionally amongst my colleagues in mathematics or computer science or engineering 
that they are actively discriminating against women or even unconsciously discriminating against women, we need to see um, much more encouragement before Cambridge at high school level at, um, right through the educational system of women in science. But if we see uneven sex ratios, we shouldn't immediately cry sexism. My own personal field of research is autism, a field of, dis of disability, where we see massive um, uneven sex ratio. In uh, autism, it's four males for every one female. In Asperger's syndrome, it's ten males for every one female. I don't, when I see a difference in sex ratio, I don't immediately cry sexism. I look for factors that might explain why we ended up with different uh, sex ratios uh, as, uh, as an outcome. So I want to conclude by saying that let's not be complacent, let's keep searching our institutions for evidence of sexism, but currently Cambridge University is not institutionally sexist, at least at the level of the undergraduate, and we would like to see changes continue at higher levels within the university. And I would ask you to oppose the motion as it's worded. Thank you. Um, and I'm quite glad I have a reply. I often try to say too much in too little time. Uh, it's a crime I'm guilty of, but not ashamed of. So what does Women's Union do? We are actually working for our own elimination. Very few people do believe that, but I would be very happy to see the day when we don't need Women's Union. But right now, we are busy focusing our energies on things that we need to be focusing on. You said that there is a policy available if you felt that a supervisor was treating you unfairly. There actually is not. There's a general complaints procedure. But right now, the policy, which is meant to support students if they feel a supervisor is being appropriate, has been in the works for two and a half years. And it's only because of KUSU campaigning that it's going to hopefully make the University Council by the end of the year. And that's actually something that KUSU is very heavily involved in right now. And so right now, that is a sort of a policy failure of the University. It's, it's a failure to address these needs. And it's not purely anecdotal, but anecdotal evidence. If it amounts to a general trend, I mean, that is what a social trend is. It affects people. It's human beings. And I think we can't forget that, that we are talking about human beings who each have their own story and their own experience of sexism, because that's really important. So what do we do about what happens in Cambridge, outside of Cambridge? We do campaign on the pay gap, which actually, if you look at reputable sources, is significant. For 24-year-old graduates, full-time workers, is at 15%. That's before you have children, however many you choose to have or not have. It still exists. It's still significant. So, for example, we were doing a workshop this weekend about drafting letters to MPs and representatives about our worry at the pay gap. We me, can, I, can I just ask, if the motion is about Cambridge University being institutionally sexist, why are we looking at issues like the pay gap? Because really we're just focusing on Cambridge University. I think it's a different motion about, about pay in wider society or whether wider society is sexist. I, I have yet to see any convincing evidence that there isn't a pay gap within Cambridge University, especially to take into account the, how few fellows there are who are female and how many betters there are who are female. Um, there is a pay gap, I'm certain, Cambridge University. Um, maybe it's not as bad as on other institutions. Maybe we are more enlightened here. I would hope so. Um, but it does exist, and these inequalities do exist in Cambridge, and they affect Cambridge students as well. So I am just responding to Hugo's question about what does women's union do? And violence against women, um, you said that has something to do with Cambridge. And if you read TCS today, we read about a student, a female student at Pembroke being sexually threatened outside the window. We read about a female student in Kings being sexually assaulted in the bar. And that's not even going into all the women who don't speak up. Because this happens. They do, and also I will cover that in a second. And I, I think, I, I agree. I think do women also not have a, a, a role and a responsibility to not dress in as few clothes as possible and not dress in as few clothes as possible.
I think the house says no. I, I said, do, do men not get sexually assaulted by women? And, and are they not more hesitant to divulge the, the fact that they have been sexually assaulted? And do women not have a responsibility to dress appropriately, because it's freezing cold outside, and to not drink themselves into intoxication? I would say that men have... a woman who's wearing short skirts not think it's okay to rape her. I would say that. by men and women, and that is a serious issue we need but to support men doing. Um, but I also would say what I just said in reference to who holds the responsibility of rape. For me, it's not the woman. It is actually the person who is the aggressor, um, whether the victim be male, female, whether the aggressor be male, female. Um, so violence against women does affect women in Cambridge, and that's something that we campaign in on. And if a university fails to provide the support that it can do for survivors of violence, then I would say that the institution sexism, whether it's intentional, non-intentional, um, conscious, unconscious. So I'm not calling all women the same. I'm not calling all men misogynists. Thank you for your point. Sexism hurts men. It does. Sexism hurts women. I'm calling sexism something that, when, for the purpose of this debate, if something bad happens <coughs> to a lot of women, I'd say that is sexist. Um, I think I'm finding myself in a position where I need to sort of defend that I'm not actually for violence. Of course I'm not. I, I, I'm not. I disagree with violence, whoever you conflicted on, but I am looking at general social trends. So if you look at something like domestic violence and sexual violence, it does disproportionately affect women. That, does, <coughs> that doesn't mean that we cannot support the men who suffer from it. But we do, I, we do need to support women as well. And right now I'm looking also who holds the power in our society and it is largely men. And that is not for all men. As Professor Greer said, it is in the masculinist interest. It's not in the best interest of men or women, which is why we need more men like you to point out that actually the current gender paradigm is faulty and it's hurtful. And which is actually why the women's campaign is also launching a campaign about feminist men and men who challenge what gender roles for men and for women, and men who challenge violence against women. I'm sorry, we have no more interruptions. I do still call them feminists because for me, feminism means the social, political, and economic equality between men and women. For me, it's no brainer. If men choose to self define in a different way, um, then I'd be happy with that in terms of defining different words like feminism, and I'd be very happy to hear from men who wants to come and speak to me about gender issues because. That's obviously something I'm very passionate about and very interested in. So looking at the amount of men in positions of power, um, I am speaking for women because I believe that women aren't being heard and that men have more chances to make themselves heard. And doesn't mean that they're taking those chances and that doesn't mean that they're represented by all their leaders, but I do think that women still need to be campaigning on behalf of their safety, their rights, their academic equality. And so for me, fighting sexism is not just about, you know, looking at figures and statistics that show us that, look, there are women in the university, because that seems to be a lot of what we are hearing from opposition. There are women in the university, and there are social choice, they, they make choices which are socially influenced, <coughs> which means they don't study computer science as much as they study English, yet they still receive fewer firsts in English. 
it's all quite simple for me, and I do believe that actually we agree quite a lot, and I'm happy about that. Um, however, I am not willing to leave sexism in the past tense. As pretty much the main point of my speech is, we need to be aware of the sexism that's happening, the masculinism, call it what you will, we need to be aware of the inequalities which exist in our community and which can be challenged on every level by individuals, by policies, by leaders, and that is something that we need to do. And I'm sure that we can do it at some point, but we're not there yet. I think that's quite important to keep in mind. obligatory plug of upcoming union events. Um, I'd like to ask Rose to talk very quickly about our Halloween entertainment over the next couple of days. Alright, tomorrow's Halloween. We've got trick or treat during the day. So anybody who comes in the classroom, trick or treat's a magic word, we're getting handy. Um, we've got Rocky Horror Picture Show movie being shown tonight at 10.30 in the Blue Room, if anybody wants to stick a box. And tomorrow we've got our blog, Night of the Living Dead, going straight until 3 a.m. So even if you've got a college box, drag everybody down for our late night happy hour starting at 12.30 and um, costume party and spooky decor and all the rest. <laughs> uh, right, thanks very much. So a couple of debates tomorrow, next week, I want to mention very quickly, particularly as there are different dates than some of you may have got from the term card. The Footlights vs Oxford Review comedy debate is here Monday night from 8 o'clock and the No Confidence debate, um, proposed by Oliver Letwin, proposed by Will Redfern over there, is Thursday night, 7.30, here in the chamber. The other event to watch out for next week, Tuesday night, is our American Election Night event. We've got, America, we've got drinks at the bar, we've got big screen coverage all night, indeed, and through into the morning in the chamber. We've got speeches, we've got speeches by Dr. Stephen Berman from the University of Sussex, Jody Williams from the Obama campaign, and Jordan Myers, the president of the Cambridge Democrats Forum. Um, so please do come join us for all those events next week if you're on the website. We now proceed to the vote. The results will be announced the bar very shortly, but I now ask the House to divide. Eyes to the right, those to the left, and abstentions down the middle. Thank you very much.